Good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to the meetup. My name is Lavanya Mohan and uh, today I will talk about consumer driven contract testing. Before I get started with the session, uh, I want to know what are your expectations from this presentation? Sorry? No, it's not something to do with blockchain. <laughs> Nowadays, API testing is becoming so common. So I want to know how it's been done or what stack has been used for uh, API okay. testing. So we'll cover that. Yeah. What else? I think one more thing is like, uh, if my application want to be integrated with outside world, and if that is not ready, how do I make sure my application works integration with this outside world, whichever the, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm not sure whether that will be a part of this talk, mm -hmm. but maybe uh, if I can't cover it, then we can catch up offline and discuss sure. that as well. Anything else? Uh, I think you're missing one important thing, uh, testing in microservices. Right. Here, how you make sure all the microservices contracts are working properly and how you can... Okay, great. I'm pretty sure we'll cover, touch up on that. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, I want to know, like... Uh, Sorry. For example, if there is multiple workflow and multiple mul microservices are there, how can we handle it like? Okay, I'm yeah, okay, we'll touch up on that. CI? Yeah, okay. We'll talk about that as well. All right, uh, so let's get started. I'll tell you a story from one of the companies that I worked for previously, uh, a project from that. I'm not selling the project by uh, like the product, okay. Uh, but yeah, we were working on an app, which is an OTT, that is over the top entertainment app. So something similar to your Netflix or Hook. Uh, you could stream videos and watch them online. And the things that we had were, uh, we could show users premium content, which meant that uh, only some subscribed users, like only the subscribed users get to see this content. But then there are whole, a bunch of free content which everyone can watch. Right? So it was a freemium model, which meant free users can watch as well, but they have limited access to content. And if you are a subscribed user, you can watch everything. And free users uh, would see ads. So that was another way of monetizing. Apart from subscriptions, ads was another way of monetizing. Right? Uh, the other thing that we had was offers. So even if you're not a paid user, but you've been on the system for quite some time, then maybe we would allow you free access to premium content for a certain duration. Or maybe if it's your birthday, then yeah, okay, you get free, you can watch the premium content for free. Things like that, okay? Uh, I will talk about the architecture in, in certain, like uh, a bit. Uh, this is a very simplistic view. We had two services. We had a lot more, but let's just focus on two. So it was a microservice architecture. We had a lot of services. Uh, let's focus on two. Billing sub service, user privilege service, and the app, of course. OK, so now let's talk about uh, the billing service. As the name suggests, it dealt with the subscriptions of the users, right? uh, the billing. And there was one API which just returned whether that user is a subscribed user or not. So if it returns active, then it means the user is a subscribed user and has an active plan. Otherwise, it's inactive, all right? Uh, and it returns other information like what's the end date of the plan, when did the plan actually start, and so on, okay? Then there, was, there is this uh, API uh, service in between called user privilege service. This talks to the billing service, and if the billing service says that the user is active, then the user privilege service will say, okay, now this user can see premium content, which means show premium is true. Okay? And we say, do not show ads. So show ads is false. But let's say the billing service said it was an inactive user, then this user privilege service might say, uh, show premium false and show ads true. But then uh, it's not just that, right? It has more logic, right? If it's your birthday, then it'll say, oh, yeah, show premium true. But then maybe you also need to see ads because we're letting you see premium content. 
uh, but it's okay if you see ads as well. Right? So, so those kind of combinations, all that logic was part of this service. And finally, we had our app, which, uh, which just took the data from user privilege service and based on that, either let the users uh, watch the content or not. All right? Any questions up to this point? All right, so there was one day where uh, we got a call late in the night, and uh, the customer support team said that all premium users, subscribed users are complaining that they cannot watch premium content. That's very scary, right? They are the top uh, most customers that we had, and they were unhappy. So, so we decided we have to debug this. Uh, just knowing whatever I spoke about, right, like the simplistic view of uh, the product, what would you do as a first step to debug? Logs, okay, yes, uh, that's one thing. What else? All right, if you're saying logs, uh, which service would you look at first? Would you look at billing or you would look at billing service, right? Yeah, so that's pretty much what we did. Uh, we we first hit the API and we saw the response, right? And when we saw the response, it said user is active, so it looks like billing service doesn't have a problem, right? So next, what we did is we looked at the user privilege service. So when we hit the API of user privilege service, it said show premium false. Okay. So basically, what happened was billing service said, yeah, your user is active. The user privilege service said, but user cannot watch premium content. And that, of course, meant that very angry customers, right? So what do you think went wrong? Which of these uh, components has the issue? Billing? Yeah, that's, uh, why would you say billing, sorry? Oh, let's go back one step. So billing said it is active, right? And the user privilege service said that show premium is false. So you're saying user privilege service? Was there any change in the contract? Right, so uh, we also first thought that it would be user privilege service which is doing something wrong. And uh, we checked what had changed. But there was no deployment for like three days. So it was very unlikely that something in user privilege service broke. And there were no monitoring alerts as well. So then we looked at billing service, whether there was any change there. And there was. What were the changes? It was just lint error fixes, nothing else. Now, uh, have any of you used any linting tool? OK, very few, right? Uh, so basically, it is just a tool that shows you uh, clean code, like code itself. So it might give you, so based on what tool it is and what you configure, it might give you errors like your method is too long, your line is too long, maybe you should declare this variable as private, and so on. So in this case, for example, it said uh, this particular variable should be final. right? And there were many such uh, errors or warnings when we integrated, when we added this lint to uh, the billing service. right? And and the engineers just uh, fixed all these code quality uh, check errors and deployed the code, right? So, so then we looked at the response again. What was the previous response and what the current response is? So the one on the left is what the response was earlier and the one on the right is what the response was after deployment. Can you see any difference? Status? Case, 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 that's right. So status became from a uppercase S to a small lowercase s. And why would this have happened? Because, well, that linting tool would have said convention is to use a camel case with a small, s, a small letters uh, at the start. So, well, the engineers fixed it. They fixed the uh, code quality, whatever, right? Uh, that kind of an error and just deployed it without thinking much about the contract. And then that's why the contract changed. Uh, user privilege service didn't realize that it was getting status active when it started saying, no, this user cannot watch premium content. Because the test passed, right? Correct. That's the question. So why did the test not catch it? Very good question. Why would you? 
Can anyone just guess? Right. So, okay, let's first talk about what kind of tests we had. We had unit tests, we had integration tests, we had end-to-end -end UI tests. So ideally something somewhere should have caught it, right? Like in unit tests, you would test individual, let's say public methods almost. So ideally if your code uh, was tested, then this should have been caught. Did it get caught? Did it, was it caught? Actually it was caught, but since the engineers were fixing thousands and thousands of uh, lint errors. They just fixed the test as well in a wrong way, but then they just changed the test to expect something else. They changed the test to expect a small s. Right? Uh, now, integration tests, we had that as well. Uh, okay, there is some uh, difference in the way people imagine integration tests. So, some people say that bring up one service, test it from the controller layer to the service layer to the repository, DB, whatever, right? that just take one service and testing it from the controller till the database, uh, that is integration test. Some other people think, like imagine it to be a testing interaction between two services. So if user privilege service and billing service are interacting with each other, then we start both these services and test from the user privilege service and check the response that actually uh, billing service gives back. So spinning up both services and doing a test, that's another, uh, that's, that's another type of integration test. So the first one, we can call that narrow integration test, and the second one, which covers both services, we can call that broad integration test. Okay. Uh, which ones did we have? We had narrow integration test. So we didn't have a test which would spin up both these uh, microservices and communicate. We had just like, uh, spin up billing service, test from billing service controller, and like, that flow. Did, did uh, this test catch the issue? Yes, it did. Similar. Since we were fixing everything, we fixed the test. Right? And end-to-end -end test. So in end-to-end -end test, you would have all your services up and running. You would install the app. Uh, you would launch the app and verify that way. Right? Now, this should have caught it, right? What happened here? Sorry, I think the test, there is no test for the... That's right. We didn't have a test for that flow. So, yeah. Okay, so we found the error, we fixed it, and we deployed again, and customers were happy again. But we don't want such issues to happen again, right? Uh, so we want to add some test which, is, which, which will help the developers understand that there is really something wrong, and not just fix it like uh, how they did. Right? So what are the options that we have? Can any of you think of some options? What would you think you would do in this case? Uh, change the DB value to the next date and write a test for that. Change the, sorry? For example, in that case, we can add, uh, like, uh, run the cron job and uh, change the date and check whether the API is returning the status, like, for example. So that's more like on a like API level integration test is what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, but we already had that, right? And uh, they just fixed the test. Any ideas? Sorry? Most, more test? I had, sorry? More test data. Would you want to test the same thing uh, multiple times? Maybe that will just add up to the test run time as well, right? Testing edge cases. Uh, at which layer would you have that? Sorry. At the integration layer. Okay, maybe. Uh, so I guess what you're saying is more like have a broad integration test, which would spin up both uh, services, something like that. Okay, yeah, fair. That, that was one of our options, actually. Uh, so we thought that maybe we could, instead of having a narrow integration test, which just tests one service, have uh, integration tests where we spin up both these uh, services and do assertions. But the problem with that was one thing, uh, our microservices were managed by separate teams, they were written in different languages, uh, and if we really did an integration test like that, then who is the real owner of that test was again in question. Right? Plus, just spinning up these microservices and doing all that uh, is a little costly, it's a little slow. 
So we thought maybe that's not probably the best option for us. The second option that we had was to add in the UI layer. Uh, but UI tests again, right, are like have all the negative points of a broad integration test as well. Uh, plus, like if uh, you had attended the previous meetup, somebody spoke about how, uh, how flaky they can get. So, so this was really out of question. So finally, we decided that we will go ahead with consumer-driven contract tests. Now, before I talk about consumer-driven contract tests, let's understand a few terminologies. Uh, we have our billing service, right? And that is giving data that exposes an API and gives data to somebody else, right? So the giver of the data is called provider, right? Then we have the user privilege service, which takes the data and uses it and does something with it. So that is the consumer, okay? But now if you look at user privilege service and the app, then the app is actually taking data from the user privilege service and using it. So in that case, the user privilege service becomes a provider and the app becomes a consumer. So what it basically means is your services can be consumer and provider, but for different interaction points. Okay? All right. So uh, now the contract, uh, consumer-driven contract test is a test that is run on the consumer side, like from the consumer side. Uh, and the advantage of that is that it, we do assertions of only those fields that, we, that matter to us. So in our case, uh, user privilege service cares only about status field. Right? It does not care about the other three or other hundred things that were returned by the API. So the test would only have assertions on, on the field that it cares about. Right? So if the provider changes, but it changes the plan end date, it, cha it changes the key of the plan end date, it adds new keys, or it changes the type itself from, uh, let's say, you know, plan end date, we change the type from string to a long, then the consumer test wouldn't fail because the consumer is not really affected. But if we change the status from capital S to small s, then the consumer test will fail because uh, that's what it cares about. All right? Uh, so for doing this consumer uh, side, like consumer-driven uh, contract testing, we used a tool called PACT. It's uh, open source, and uh, it has support for many different languages. Okay. Now the advantage of PACT is that we can test uh, the consumer and the provider independently, and this is done using uh, a mock server. So uh, I'll just show you uh, that right now. So let's, let's first look at the consumer side verification, okay? Uh, we have our user privilege service, the consumer service, and a, uh, a mock provider. So uh, on consumer, we will mock the provider, right? And what we do first is we, uh, the test will define interactions. Okay, for some, all right. So what are interactions? It basically says, uh, like it tells the provider, uh, the mock, mock provider, that if you get a request for, for this endpoint with these parameters, these headers, then you should respond like this. With these headers, this should be your response body. All right? That's basically defining interactions. So that's what, that's the first step of your uh, test. And after that, your test code calls your uh, real code, right? It's like a JUnit test, if you think of it. It's, a, it's almost like, it's, it is like your unit test. So it would, you would call a method in your code. The, the code would make an actual HTTP call, but instead of calling the real provider, it will call the uh, mock provider. Okay, the clicker doesn't seem to work. Right? So it will make an actual request uh, to the uh, mock provider. And if, uh, like the mock provider will see if all the request params as mentioned in the definition are there. And if yes, then it will return the response back. And once we get the response back, we do our assertions. Okay, uh, any questions here? Yeah, yeah. so I'll show you that. Right, so if you look at the code, uh, oh, okay, sorry, just before that. Uh, now, why is this packed mock provider different from any other mock server, right? Is because it records all this in some ways. 
and generates a file called path file. And path file is your contract file. So this file can be shared with the provider and providers can uh, run their tests to see if they are meeting the contract. All right, so that's how it is different from a normal any other mock, uh, mock server. Now to your question about defining interactions. Uh, so this is how the code uh, looks like. So in your test, you would uh, say, you would say it's a contract between your billing service and your user privilege service, right? Uh, you'll say if you send a request to the billing info endpoint with these uh, query params and it is a get method, uh, then you should get a response like this, okay? Uh, so here in this case, we are, well ideally in our case it would be just status, we don't really care about any other field. So, so that's all, it's a minimal uh, response that we're expecting back. Okay? And, and one important thing is, so in this case we're assuming that the user is in a particular state, right, is present in the database. So when we want to run this test on the provider side, we need to tell the provider that we're expecting this. So that's called state, and we can define that as well. So this line, which says given user one is, uh, has an active state, that's basically telling the provider that uh, this is what we expect to be, uh, like the initial preconditions, okay? And so, so this is your defining your intera interactions part. After that, you will have your real code, which is very simple, like any, uh, so this is okay, uh, this is JUnit. Uh, if you're using any other language, it'll be similar to your unit testing code. So it just calls, uh, makes a call to the, it just uses the gateway method, which makes a call to the uh, provider mock in this case, gets the response, the code will do some uh, deserialization, maybe convert it to, into an object, and you just do a verification that whether the status is active or not. Right? And this basically gets status uh, method, is uh, just taking the status from that, JSON response, right? It's just taking a status code with a capital S. All right. Any questions? Okay. So this was the consumer side. Now let's look at the provider side. Provider side uh, test. So we, we share the path file. Assume we've shared it in some way. What will uh, that the test do? It will just uh, replay that request exactly with those uh, uh, headers and parameters and it will check the real response from the service. So this is a real, real service, real uh, provider service, and a mock consumer in service, right? So it will check the response, and it will say, check, like, let, it's okay if the response has 10 values, it should at least have those values which the consumer cares about. So it should at least have uh, status and user ID in this case, all right? So that's the provider side verification. Now, uh, provider side verification actually packed handles on its own, like a lot of things on its own. So we don't really have to say much except where to get the packed file from. So this could be uh, a file itself. We can say where to get, uh, like a file uh, in your file system, some location. You can say that, or it could be a URL, or we can use pack broker. Uh, I'll come to that shortly. Right? So this is the almost the only thing that you need. Apart from that. Uh, since the consumer had said that it expects the user to be in a particular state, that's something you have to do on the provider side. So this is, uh, in this case, we're just adding that user into the database. So this runs before the test actually does uh, like the verification, right? Uh, before the API call is actually made. Okay, so on the provider side, it's just this much. You just would set your state, tell the test where to fetch, fetch the packed file from, and it does everything on its own. All right? How does it compare with Postman? Uh, so multiple things. Uh, so here we are looking at contract testing. Uh, in Postman, you would just probably do a post request and then verify the response on its own, right? Here we are driving it from consumer side. Uh, so the consumer says what it needs, uh, what it expects, and then you do the assertions on the provider. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, suppose if you're putting an API uh, request, so there is a way, right, where we can uh, write some codes that we are expecting these values in the uh, response. 
Correct. Yeah. And and uh, so so okay. One more thing. I think Postman recently also uh, has developed something to do consumer driven contract test. But uh, okay, I have not really looked at that in detail. But otherwise, the API request and response that you are talking about that would be a normal integration test as well, right? Like if you in Java world you might use REST assured, which will call an API endpoint. Uh, it'll go through, do whatever, the code will do whatever, and return the response, and you will have assertions on your response, right? Uh, but here, we are saying that we had those tests, but still, the developers went ahead and changed those tests, even though they made bre breaking changes. So we wanted a way to, s to have like a test across these microservices, right? And we want a way to, uh, for the consumers to say that this is what is important to us and this is what we expect. So the, if the provider changes, then these tests should fail and it should alert because like, there, was, there should be no way to do a deployment after this. Like, the provider, uh, if provider makes a breaking change, then they should not be able to deploy. As in they should not be able to fix the test on their side and then say it's good to go. If, if tests are driven from the consumer side, then either the consumer has to change uh, or they actually fix the code, not the test. Uh, so I just want to understand, so here what you're doing is like the developers develop the code, right? They have done the deployment, then you are doing the testing, right? No, it's not after deployment, it's prior to deployment. Prior it's to like deployment. your unit test, so oh, it would it's run. It's kind of unit testing that yeah, you're talking yeah. about. So you are giving more importance to unit testing, right? In, in every situation, It's like a test in between your unit and integration. Mm, I understand. Okay. Yeah, it will run much faster. If you have many more microservices, yeah, you can have you can have contracts for all those microservices. Uh, this is in Java. The demo code is in Java, but uh, Pat supports multiple languages: Python, Ruby, many JavaScript. So you can use whatever you want. And your provider and consumer also don't need to have the same language. Because this packed file which, is ge which gets generated is, uh, in some sense, language agnostic. It, it's a JSON file. And packed will handle the testing part. Right, and we can test those independently. So, consumer, so this is consumer driven, right? So consumer says it cares about these three fields, for example. 
that's the contract between the consumer and the provider. Now, provider can give 10 additional fees and that's fine. But if the pro basically you check on the provider side whether at least those three fields are set back. Right? So consumer generates this contract on one side and then later this contract is shared. So that is the packed file. It's shared to the provider and provider does test on its side. So consumer and provider are tested at like, sorry? At the same time, no, they are tested independently. Time doesn't matter here. I'll come to that. Like, I'll probably show you the CI pipelines, and maybe that will help understand. Mm -hmm. Pact handles it on its own. Yeah, and it's a JSON file that gets generated. Actually. Yeah. And they export different values. Right. Right. I expect I for some field like status Correct. and some other people for some other field. Correct. So now I have different things to respond, right? Take like, yeah. care. So when I create a list, so who maintains the thing? As a provider, I need to maintain those responses. Uh, no. As a consumer, so you would have 10 different consumers consuming 10, uh, expecting 10 different things. Consumer, I mean, right. You're a provider. You don't have to worry much. Uh, consumers will uh, right, write right. their con consumer side test, and they will mention what they expect. That many packed files will be generated, and that will be shared. So okay. the provider will just pull all those packed files. Whenever there are there is change on the provider side, it will pull all those packed files and do all do verification for all. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. you would define different things and that would generate a packed file right for your provider side test you would just pull the packed file and do that so they will be on on the same service layer but uh, it would be different tests does that answer your question Uh, you mean this? Yeah, so we, we actually say the state. No, so this is, okay, this is the provider side code. And here I'm using the repository, so provider side repository to actually save information in the provider side database. Right? So this happens before the provider side test is run. So that when it hits, like when the mock consumer hits the API, uh, the actual code will run. It will fetch the data from the DB. And then uh, it will return the response, right? Whatever, serialize it and return the response. And then the assertion will happen. Right? Now, these are not uh, deployed instances. They are just, uh, like, if you're using Gradle, you would just say Gradle W test. And whatever that does is what is here. OK? Fair enough. That's true. Uh, in our case, luckily, we didn't have that many. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's true. Uh, so there is Pact Broker, which does a lot of, uh, uh, which helps you in, in these things uh, in a lot of ways. So it, it deals with uh, having those contracts in place, versioning of the contracts, and, and so on. So, so there, is, there is a tool which kind of helps you there. But then again, yeah, if there are 100 microservices, it's going to be uh, not very easy. Hmm. 
Right, right, that's true. Uh, but this one solves another issue, like which we had. So our APIs were returning very big responses. Okay, uh, like what would usually happen is some features would be prioritized. The like API teams would do it, and then it would be scrapped later. Uh, so the consumers didn't do it. Right now, it wasn't removed immediately, and over a period of time, we didn't know which consumer was using what data, and it felt like a lot of these keys are sort of redundant, right? Uh, one approach is to talk to an Android dev and say, hey, you know what, tell me what all you need, and then I'll remove others. But the problem with that is, one, you're looking at only the current code base. So you don't know what has been released previously. Second, if you want an, like if your iOS app consumes different values, then you have to talk to those that team as well. And there is that uh, error in communication might happen. So, so in such cases, this helps, because then you know what fields you can remove, and then you don't have to worry about it at all. So that was one of the other use case that we had. So we, that's why we went ahead with it. OK, so let's move ahead. Uh, so, so we said that the consumer side generates that packed file, and provider side uses that packed file to uh, run its test to do the verification. right? Uh, so that basically means that you have to share the packed file. One way is to share it via file system. So if uh, both can access the same file system. Then you put it in that location, and then uh, the producer can just pick it up. Or through some URL, or you can even push it to their Git repository almost, right? Something like that. Or finally, Pact Broker. Uh, so Pact Broker is, again, an open source tool developed by the same people. Uh, this does versioning as well. It handles versioning. It handles a lot of things. So you don't really have to build everything from uh, scratch. So this is what I use for the demo as well. Pack definition? If there is a change on the provider side, you don't update the pack definition file because it's still uh, an, a key or whatever right? that you, as a consumer, don't really care about yet. But if you, as a consumer, now start consuming that new key, for example, uh, for a new feature, then is when you would update it because now you care about that key. So you wouldn't update it on provider side changes. You would update it on your own side changes, like consumer side changes. OK? All right, so let's look at uh, it all together with, with CI. Maybe it will uh, give a slightly more clear picture. Right? So first is the consumer side test. So we would just uh, run maybe your unit test, and then the pack test, and, and then publish the pack. Publish the pack file, which is generated. OK? Uh, so running pack test is also like running unit test in some sense. So you can say gradle w test. Uh, or here I just made it a different stage by giving like which folder it needs to look at. But it could still have been just one stage. OK? And, and publishing pack, uh, so we would publish it whatever, right? like put it in a file system or some URL which we are going to use, like the provider is going to use, or publish it to Pact Broker. So to publish it to Pact Broker, there are uh, certain plugins that we can use, or it could be just a curl command which does a put to the Pact Broker. OK? So this is your consumer side uh, pipeline. And this is how the UI of Pact Broker looks. So right now, there is only one contract between uh, user privilege service and billing service. If there were others, then you would have many more. It just tells you what, uh, which contract, uh, which consumer and which provider have a contract. OK? Then second step is to have the provider pipeline. Right? Uh, you want, now that you've generated a packed file, you would, uh, the provider would pull the packed file and run the test and check whether it actually gives the correct response. So on the provider side, again, you would just run the packed test. That's it. Right? So, so let's say the provider, in our case, billing service, made that breaking change uh, from uh, capital S to small s. Right? So then uh, the test would fail. And the pipeline would go red. Why? Because the packed file says, I expect something in capital S. You're I don't see that in the response. And if you look at the uh, error, so this will, 
This is like your normal uh, unit test error. It is very targeted, so it says exactly what the issue is. Okay. Now, in order to fix this test, like in our case, when we had the unit test or integration test fail, uh, the developers just went and changed that S and the test pass and they pushed the code, right? In this case, to fix the test, you can't do that. Why? Because you need to change the path file. That's one. Who will change the path file? Like if, if you really wanted to go green with the ex existing provider code, you would have to change the path file. But path file is generated by the consumer, right? So then you would maybe go and talk to user privilege service and say, hey, you know what, uh, can you change? And they'll say, no, we can't because we expect it to be capital S, right? So in this case, like even by mistake, your uh, engineers cannot make a change like that and fix the test and push it. It kind of definitely blocks you. Okay? Clear? All right. So, so this was how uh, the provider side, like if they make an issue, then uh, make a breaking change, then how it, it fails, right? But what if the consumer makes the breaking change? So you'll, let's say uh, there was no change in billing service. But you saw the code earlier, right? Uh, user privilege service expects a capital S, correct? What if the, the user privilege service team did linting fixes or something, and then they happen to change this? They, they happen to change status from capital to small. What would happen then? Then also, I can do Correct. So two things would happen. One is if they run the test only by changing this code, then the consumer side pact itself will fail because it's say, uh, the, because the test earlier was expecting cap, uh, and then the code will start expecting small s, but the, in our, uh, when we define interactions, we would have still said capital S. So consumer side test will fail. Now if, if we change the uh, expectation, of the response, like in the definition itself, and change that also to small, then the consumer side test would pass, but it will generate a new packed file, correct? Because now the contract has changed, like consumer is saying there is a change in contract, right? So it generates a new packed file. So whenever a new packed file generate, is generated, the provider side test should run, okay? That is important. So when the consumer says that I, that I am expecting a change in contract, the provider side test should run. Right? So the consumer will generate a packed file, it will be published to the packed broker. Now there are webhooks in packed broker where we can say that if there is a new contract, then trigger the provider pipeline automatically. Okay? So, so we can have that, like this is one webhook which says if the contract content is changed, then trigger the billing service build. Okay? So in this case, uh, the billing service build will get triggered. It will go red for sure because billing service is actually still returning capital S. Uh, and fine, we're good. But is that enough? Okay, it's not really enough because what would happen is consumer side team would just push their code, but who's going to look at somebody else's pipeline, right? Right? I mean, I don't think I would take the effort to look at somebody else's pipeline. Right? So that's not enough. Just triggering the pipeline is not enough. You need a feedback back to the on the consumer side itself. So, uh, so the provider needs to say whether it was after the provider pipeline ran. It needs to tell the packed broker again whether it was a success or a failure. So, it in this case, it will say hey, it was a failure to the packed broker. And that again, just uh, sending that message back to the pack broker is also not enough because you're not going to look at pack broker UI either. The consumer pipeline needs to know. So for that, uh, there is a Ruby gem called Can I Deploy, which is again developed by, by these folks who actively use uh, pack. It keeps polling the pack broker and keeps checking for the status. So, so we can add that in our consumer side pipeline so every time there is a change in uh, path, it will wait for the response from provider side. And then if it's green, great, it'll all go green. If it's red, this, this stage will fail. So now the consumer cannot deploy because uh, their pipeline is red. Okay? So let's do a quick recap. We have consumer. Let's say the consumer makes some change. 
then it will generate a new packed file and it will publish that to the packed broker. If there is a new contract, then packed broker will automatically trigger the provider pipeline. Then the provider pipeline will return the res uh, response, like the val uh, verification status, right? If it's pass or fail. And there will be something which will keep polling the packed broker to, to know whether it is a pass or a fail and then will tell the consumer Yes, you can go ahead with the deployment or you can't, okay? And if there is a change on the provider side, it will always pull the packed file and do assertions again. Okay? Is that fine? Right, so I can show a demo. Uh, I think I'm already, I have overshot time, so maybe I will just show the video instead of doing it on, showing the full code itself. Okay, is it visible? Okay. okay. Uh, so this one has uh, consumer side uh, changes. So here on the consumer side, we removed status uh, and made it uh, small s. And we changed the contract as well. We are now saying we expect it to be a small s. Okay. Uh, and let's say we push this code. Now currently everything is on my local system, so uh, so the pipeline won't be triggered automatically. So I'll just uh, manually trigger the pipeline. Okay, it's not very clear, I guess. But yeah, so so ideally, when you would commit, like push this code, uh, your pipeline will be automatically triggered. In this case, since it's local, I did it manually. Uh, so your unit tests would run, your pack tests would run, and if it's all green, it will publish the new contract that is generated. So here, when you see that, uh, you can see that it was like a new contract was published right now, and till now there is no verification that has happened. Now when a new contract is published, this billing service, the provider test got triggered automatically. And it will run verification on its side. Now this will fail because it actually returns a capital S, but your pact is saying it expects a small s. Right? Yeah, so it failed and it will return that status back to the pack broker. And then your can we deploy them will get the status and your consumer pipeline will go red. All right? Clear? That's pretty much what I had uh, wanted to show. I'll just show one additional thing. So pack broker uh, maintains versions as well. So you can almost see which version of consumer with which version of provider was green, which was red. So it, it maintains this history as well. Right? Okay, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover uh, in the session. These are a bunch of references. So um, PACT has great documentation that's definitely worth reading. Uh, there's also a video from folks from Atlassian who've spoken about this and it's uh, it's pretty nice, uh, definitely uh, must watch. Uh, I mean, a good watcher. Yeah. And uh, I have also, whatever code that I used for the demo, I have uh, pushed that to Git, so you can have a look at that as well. All right, uh, any other questions? No questions? Okay, thank you.